Welcome to the Vision for Life podcast, an ongoing conversation between the pastors of Fellowship Denver and the church at large. Each week, we talk about life, faith, the Bible, and how to follow Jesus as we go about our daily lives. I'm Autumn, host of the podcast, and today, Becky Brayman and Jen Shepard, two friends and members of Fellowship Denver, are joining me. Becky, Jen, welcome. I'm so glad that you agreed to spend some time with me here today. Thanks for having us. <laughs> this conversation that we're going to have today is specifically about foster care and then an organization that Fellowship Denver partners with called Safe Families. And this is one of a series of conversations that we're having on the podcast in which we're asking, what does it mean to actively love our neighbors? And in Jesus' conception of the Old Testament law, he said, love of God and love of neighbor are the fulfillment of of the law. He also made it distinctly clear that this love of neighbor is active and isn't boundaried by the ways that we often assess whether someone is deserving of our help or not. And he also, in that, in his teaching in the law in the New Testament, mentioned repeatedly different groups of vulnerable individuals. We see that as a repeated theme throughout the New Testament as well in the church. He mentioned widows, orphans, and the poor as people who we should actively, we, the church, the followers of Jesus, should actively love and support. And so we're asking that question in this series of conversations. What does that love of neighbor look like in our modern context in Denver? Then we also hope to encourage our listeners and our Fellowship Denver family to ask who are the vulnerable people around us? Who are our neighbors in need and in pain? And what does it look like to respond to those needs? And then ultimately, that engaging in this work often looks like bringing our relational presence as the people of God and the family of God to these spaces where we meet vulnerable individuals and welcome them in and offer ourselves and our resources to them as a way to directly meet those needs. So first, I'm wondering if you would just share with our listeners a little bit about yourselves. I asked the two of you to join me on the podcast because you're directly involved in this work in foster care and in safe families. And so I would love for you to just introduce yourself first and share a little bit about um, yourselves with us. Hi, this is Becky, and my family and I have been coming to fellowship for about three years. We have five forever kiddos and one foster baby in our house right now. Um, We've been foster parents for five years and have been involved in safe families for nearly one year. Uh, This is Jen, and my husband and I have been at Fellowship Denver for ever. Um, we, <laughs> I can attest to that for a long, long time, <laughs> for a really long time. Um, we were foster parents, um, maybe about 10 years ago to a teenager, uh, 15 going on 16. And then most recently we've done a foster care for, um, two young boys who we ended up adopting in 2019 out of foster care. And all of your kiddos, your families are also a part of our Fellowship Denver Mm -hmm. family. So when you talk about these kids, Becky, you said your forever family. And then Mm -hmm. Jen, the boys who you've adopted, they're a part of our Fellowship Denver family, our ministries. They participate in kids ministry and student fellowship. And they are. They're fully integrated. (laughs) Yes. All over the church. (laughs) Yeah, all over the church. (laughs) Literally. (laughs) Running around. Yes, literally. (laughs) Um, what led each of you, you can just answer this in whatever order here, uh, what led each of you to decide to invest in foster care? So what compelled you initially to get involved in foster care? I think this is Becky. Um, our family, Joel and I were looking for a way that we could love children and that we could serve neighbors in as an entire family and, Mm -hmm as part of just our daily walk, as opposed to an event that we did separately. And um, just kind of briefly, it's been really beautiful to see our kids welcome other children without any um, questions or judgment and just see them really welcome kids into our home with open arms. Mm 
Mm-hmm. You were asking how it could be integrated, how this way to love neighbors and serve others could really be integrated into your day-to-day yes. lives mm-hmm. and that you could do as a whole family. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, this is Jen. And I think for me personally, um, I've always felt, gosh, maybe since high school, just a deep need to desire, calling, whatever you will, um, to provide a home for kids who need one um, ever since I can remember. And so I've been involved in some aspect of foster care since high school, um, throughout college, um, and then after college as well, um, through work and things like that. Um, And then when I met Mark, he said, yes, he was interested in foster care, but then I later learned it was just to get the girl. He's like, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> so then um, we waited. You cared about it, so he cared about he it. He wanted <laughs> to get the girl, so he said yes uh, to foster care. Um, but, you know, a few years later, I was like, well, I'm not quite sure, you know, he's ready yet because it, it really does take a team. Um, and so... We prayed through it, and and a number of years after we got married, we both decided we would just start taking one step at a time and see where it led, and it led to a house full of boys today. So that's why we're here. Yeah. (laughs) Jen, I think it's helpful to note that uh, what are the ages of your boys? Um, So my two biological boys are 10 and 12, and our two adopted boys are 10 and 12. Yes. So they're all <laughs> 10 and 12. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is this. So the way we see them at church everywhere mm-hmm. is often probably the way your home is too. Mm-hmm. A lot of activity. Uh, yes. Very energetic. <laughs> <laughs> In these episodes, as I mentioned, we're contemplating this biblical notion of love of neighbor and the story that we've turned to in past episodes in which Jesus talks about this very clearly is the story of the Good Samaritan. And so many of the ways in which we see love of neighbor take shape are demonstrated in the way Jesus told the story. The act of the Samaritan was sacrificial. He extended his himself and his resources to meet the need of the person in need. And he stepped over boundaries or disregarded them to help the person who was in need. And so what, what parallels do you see in that call to the church in our modern context to in, to offer that sort of love of neighbor to vulnerable families, particularly people impacted by the foster care system, so the kids and families who are involved in the foster care system. In both foster care and safe families, you're loving people that you've never met before in a way that's unlike what most of our culture sees as normal. Mm-hmm. Um and then we're using our resources as part of disruptive generosity to wrap around families, um, our time and our money and all of our emotional and relational resources. And we have to do it in order to do it well, we need to do it with compassion. In this conversation, I think it's helpful to get a handle on what the actual state of foster care and the need is that is present in our kind of immediate community. So in Denver or in Colorado, what are the realities of foster care? How many children are in foster care? And how would you help someone understand just what the, what the reality is of foster care in Colorado and in our local area is right now? So some of the numbers that I have are from 2020. So they may have changed a little bit because there was a recent law that went into effect in October of 2021 that's changing a little bit of how foster care will look. But at that point, the median age of a child in foster care in Colorado is seven years old. Um, The highest category of maltreatment by far is neglect, which accounts for 83% of cases. And there are around 4,800 children in foster care in Colorado right now. Many referrals for foster care are for neglect and substance abuse. Um, I think they accounted for about... Was it, did you say 83%, 83% of the cases? And, and they kind of go hand in hand. Um, most neglect is a result of substance abuse. Not all neglect is substance abuse, but they are. They are highly correlated. And where do referrals primarily come from? So for young children, they can come. I mean, babies can be referred from the hospital 
or the doctor's office. A lot of referrals happen once children reach daycare or school age um, because then ad outside adults are seeing kiddos and can get a little bit of a insight into what they may be experiencing at home. And what does that process look like once someone places a call, makes a referral to Child Protective Services? What happens from there? Um, so not every call is substantiated enough to be investigated, but um, the department will decide whether or not to investigate. And if they do, they generally make a plan. The priority is to try to support the family, if at all possible, and keep the child at home with the parent or parents. Um, through a variety of different social supports. Um, but if there is a significant safety concern, then the child will be removed from the home and will enter the foster care system. And I do think the threshold for investigation and removal is quite high for yes. that to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's what you mean by saying substantiated. Mm -hmm. Is that correct, yes. Becky? When yeah. you say once it's substantiated. So the state agencies have to have enough evidence. Mm -hmm. There's that, a lot that's that doesn't warrant investigation mm -hmm. or removal that mm -hmm. maybe you or I would be uncomfortable with, but still it's not enough to require removal or anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then once a, once an investigation is made, if it is substantiated and the child is removed, in Colorado particularly, how does that process work? Generally speaking, they will be call an emergency foster care placement and they will go into a foster care home unless they can find family immediately. Um, but the state throughout the case is always trying to find family or other adults that may be involved in the child's life, a teacher or a coach or somebody that has a connection to the child that can care for them. And usually the referring county will try to find a placement in a foster home, um, you know, if no family or kin are found. And then if they can't find a home within that county, then they start looking at private agencies to placement agencies outside the county and go from there until they okay. can find a So place it's sort of this stepped approach. Mm -hmm. They look yeah. for family first and then a placement <clears throat> in county, and mm -hmm. then they start to turn to outside agencies. Yeah. Placement, private placement agencies. Okay. And you, I think both of you mentioned this before, but the goal in Colorado, I know this exists in other places, but I'm most familiar <laughs> with it in Colorado. The goal of the foster care system is family reunification. Mm -hmm. And so as a foster parent, when you get a call that there's a kiddo who needs immediate housing. What's the experience like on that end, both in receiving that call, assessing whether or not you can answer it, and then just what does this look like in processing that you're inviting in a kiddo to your home who is from a different family system, from is a hard place, and that the goal of this process is family reunification? Um, so in our family, because we have young children, we are only able to take in really small children. And so the process looks differently than if I think we were taking in older children or adolescents. Um, but part of it depends on what we have going on in our life and if we're able to take on another kiddo. But um, is you just have to prepare yourself to love a kid and see what, what they need and be able to give yourself to them for as long as they need it. Um, and I think this is where it's really beautiful to see how our kids love other love foster children because they can do it with open arms and they don't question. Um, it's not like I will only love you if you're here for longer than two months. Mm -hmm. You know, they just love them and play with them and share their toys with them and do whatever they can to take care of them. And as a parent, it's, fun to be able to learn that from your children. Mm -hmm. And I think any family who goes through foster care training, part of that is some sort of formal checklist that you have to think through of what you would say yes to mm -hmm. in saying yes to a kid and then what is beyond your capacity to take in. Like if you um, have no experience with medical issues, you probably wouldn't take in a kid who needed a G-tube or something like that. Um, and so when a foster family would get a phone call, um, 
I don't know if this is an experience with most foster families, but we would get calls for things that were clearly we had already said no to to our agency, but they would call you anyway. And I have so, heard other similar <laughs> anecdotes. <laughs> and so just um, reminding ourselves of, hey, this is this is where my heart is. This is what we're called to. And being able to um, have the emotional stamina to say no when it's okay to say no, um, and then to say yes when it it kind of fits in um, where we feel best able to serve. Um, and I know for Mark and myself, we had said yes, I want to say to maybe six or seven calls. Um, and then each one would come back with, sorry, we found a different placement for that person. We found kid for that kid. Um, or this kid is actually going somewhere else um, before we actually got kids coming to our home. And so a lot of it is just saying yes on faith. We're not really quite sure if this would ever pan out, but I'm just saying yes. And then knowing, like Becky was talking about, when you say yes to a kid, you're also saying yes to the situation that that kid brings. Um, And some of the kid's backgrounds you're not allowed to know as a foster parent. Um, And some you kind of learn after the fact, after you've said yes, and you're like, oh, well, didn't know that, but okay, here we go. Um, But bringing the kid's story and the kid's background and the kid's whatever um, people are involved in that kid's life, whether it is biological family or kin or coaches or teachers, um, and saying yes to that situation as well without actually knowing what it's going to be when you say yes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it can look a myriad of ways. Oh, yes. Once you said yes. (laughs) Yes. Because of all of those things Mm -hmm. and the people attached and the particular Mm -hmm. situation, there is no script (laughs) for what you are taking on. You really don't even know it when you say yes. You kind of get the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, that meets those four boxes. Okay, yes. And then you learn later. It's an excellent way to practice faith. It is. (laughs) (laughs) What is one particular difficulty you've encountered in your process of fostering? Can I give two? (laughs) Yes. I think one thing is that is the amount of uncertainty and it can just be challenging to sit in uncertain situations, particularly ones that keep changing and um, still provide stability for the family in the middle of the uncertainty. And then also, I feel like I'm often reminded that sometimes you have to choose to love people that you would not naturally be inclined to love and that that's a choice and that living by faith is a choice, even when your maybe emotions or the situation wouldn't naturally incline you to otherwise. I'm going to ditto what Becky said very well. <laughs> that agreed. Is, that is agreed. <laughs> and what is one really sweet, maybe unexpected mm-hmm. gift that you have experienced from being foster parents? I think for our family, um, because I have biological children also and, um, our boys came to us as older foster kids. They came um, at the ages of six and eight. Um, just watching each one of them grow and mature and learn through the interactions with each other. Um, watching my biological kids become their best selves that they wouldn't have become if it wasn't for their two adopted brothers. And watching the two adopted boys um grow and learn and mature because of their relationships with my biological kids. Um, I don't think they would be where they are today if they didn't have each other. Mm -hmm. It's, it's beautiful, really. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I do really love seeing the impact that foster care has on the hearts of my children Mm -hmm. and just learning how to love people. Um, It's also, it's, foster care is a really beautiful and broken situation. And, um, I don't know. I just remember one time I was rocking a 18 month old who had just been removed from her mom, didn't have any words, um, to sleep. And she was so sad and crying so hard, but then to feel her kind of like melt in and feel safe in my arms. And it's a really beautiful thing to make a kid feel safe and loved, even when their world has fallen apart. 
What are some of the day-to-day realities of welcoming a child or children into your home who have come from a really hard place and experienced an abrupt disruption in their life? I think for our family, the day-to-day realities um, initially are kind of figuring out um, the strengths of the kids and then what their needs are, um, whether it's you know, the need to feel safe, the need to be responded to in a loving um, and therapeutic way. Um, the Their needs, I think, for emotional stability um, as well. And then figuring out kind of where their triggers are. Um, unknowingly, you know, they could be reacting to something that you had no idea was going to bother them and then working through what that looked like and um, finding different ways to cope and to become stronger and to move forward with that. Um, so those are all kind of like the emotional maybe needs of the day-to-day reality of taking in kids. Um, but there's also a lot of physical ones, um, just stuff. (laughs) Like, (laughs) do you come with clothes? Do Mm -hmm. you come with, um, I don't know, toothbrush. Do you come with, you know, uh, if it's a younger kid, a car seat or um, diapers and, and things like that, like some immediate physical needs as well. Mm-hmm. I think one of the big realities for any foster family of any age is there are an astounding number of appointments mm, and yes. people in and out of your house um, that can be just challenging to navigate because it happens overnight. Um, I think with toddlers also, it's navigating where they're at developmentally and what their needs are and what's calming and how to help them self just cope with life and um the day-to-day realities for babies most babies that are in the system anecdotally i don't know if this is proven like backed up by statistics but many of them are withdrawing from some sort of substance Mm -hmm. and it just requires a lot of patience and a willingness to give up a lot of sleep. I want to ask you some questions about safe families specifically to help us get to know about the organization, to understand why they exist, what they do, and then our involvement with them as an organization here at Fellowship Denver. So first, can you just share what is safe families and what is their work as an organization? Yep. So Safe Families started in Chicago in 2003, and now they have chapters in 40 states and a few different countries. But the chapter in Denver only started in 2019, right before a pandemic. And <laughs> yes. so it's they've had a lot of just hoops to jump through mm-hmm. in the last couple of years. Um, but their mission is really to wrap around vulnerable families who, if they were to find themselves in crisis, have no sort of support network or safety net that could hold them up. And Mm -hmm. so many of the families are in financial poverty, but they also, there's a lot of relational poverty and they just don't have a safe person to call when they find a crisis. Mm -hmm. In all of our conversations, this has been a common theme that Mm -hmm. economic poverty and relational poverty or social isolation are so often intertwined. Mm -hmm. And that is true, you're saying, for these families, too, Mm -hmm. who are often entering the Safe Families program. Mm -hmm. What is the mission of Safe Families? You mentioned this earlier, Becky. Mm -hmm. You mentioned three distinct points. But I think it's worth reiterating and dwelling Mm -hmm. on a little bit here um, because there are such beautiful parallels Mm -hmm. to what compels us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to love people in a really sacrificial way. So can you bring those to our attention again? Yeah. So the mission is really to keep families intact, but they approach it through radical hospitality, disruptive generosity, and intentional compassion. And that radical hospitality, I think, takes shape in the ways that you have to exist as a foster parent and what you were just describing as your actual experience, opening up your home, holding your time and your resources Mm -hmm. and who and what you will encounter really loosely Mm -hmm. is, is what that looks like. I think, Mm -hmm. is that right? Yes, it is definitely. (laughs) And what about that second point of disruptive generosity? How does that look in practice? I think one of the 
major parts of that is just remembering that everything we have has been given to us by God's grace mm-hmm. and that we're called to steward it well and um, just not holding on to that, but trying to look and see how we can use, whether it's financial resources to buy diapers for a family that is unable to or um, an extra bedroom that can house a kiddo for a couple days while their mom's in the hospital. And the third point of intentional compassion. I think this is so important for us to really wrestle with. Mm -hmm. What does that mean, both in the notion of how does safe families envision that? And then what does that mean in lived experience in your lives? I think that intentional compassion is deliberately choosing to love people. Dave Anderson was the founder of Safe Families, and he wrote that without compassion, hospitable and generous actions are hollow and invariably become a chore. And he also said that when parents are empowered, appreciated, and respected, it creates hope, and hope leads to improved well-being. So that hope that comes from compassion is a critical component of what's needed to bring safety and security to vulnerable families. Mm. I just want to reiterate what Becky's saying, too. I mean, it's choosing to be compassionate and loving toward a family when it's a really difficult situation or Mm -hmm. a situation you don't agree with maybe some of the choices they made or um, a situation with different values or different boundaries and then intentionally putting them above yourself and Mm -hmm. loving them despite the differences yeah we as the church need to wrestle with this so much because this is exactly opposite the sort of cultural messages of what love is as far as an emotion and a response and something that is internally generated um, versus what you're saying, that it Mm -hmm. is an intentional choice. And I think that aligns with both the way we see love demonstrated to us in the life of Jesus and in his death for us. He chose to love us and die for us while we were sinners The Bible says, wow, we were his enemies. And so if that is the sort of love that is displayed for us and to us, then this is the sort of love that we're supposed to replicate. Mm -hmm. And, but, (laughs) but the way we're conditioned culturally, I think does not teach us that. And that's why it's so important, incredibly important to wrestle with that and to choose to love as you both are saying, and as you both demonstrate in the ways that you live. So how does the Safe Families program work? What does it look like for someone entering the program? And then what does it look like for someone who's participating from the end of like a church or signing up from the other end of that to be a host home or to help a family who's a participant? Okay. So referrals to Safe Families for families that need the services, um, can come from a variety of sources, um, different hospitals and different social support networks can refer a family to Safe Families. And then somebody at Safe Families will chat with them and help determine what would be helpful for them. And then they send out a request to the volunteers that have signed up for different roles. So if they need hosting for a child for a few days, the request will go to the host families. If they need resources, it will go to the resource families. And there are different ways to become involved in Safe Families. Um, You can become a host family, and that is where you're willing to take in kiddos for a period of time while the parent needs the space. And sometimes it's to find housing. Sometimes it's because the parent is in the hospital for a couple days and just doesn't have somebody else to watch their kiddos while they're there. Um, there's a variety of reasons for referrals, but those are the top two reasons for referrals to say families. Um, in addition to being a host family, you can be a family friend and this is somebody that comes alongside the family. They may babysit kiddos for a little bit while mom takes a job training class. They may help the mom bring kiddos to the doctor's appointments. They just come alongside daily life and help the family um, navigate just the challenges that we all face. Mm. Um, Family coaches also come alongside the family and they maybe help mom or dad access some of the social services that they may need and really serve as more of a coach while they work on their goals. And then resource friends are really there to help support financially or tangible 
items um, if they need a car seat to bring the baby home from the hospital and they don't have the resources to buy that, a resource friend will come in and help with that. And how did our partnership at Fellowship Denver grow up with safe families? I think it came out of a conversation at Embrace. And I guess for those who at Fellowship who don't know what Embrace is, it's um, a support system for those who've been touched by foster care adoption or vulnerable families here at church. Um, and so we have families in that group who are foster parents, who are adoptive parents, who are adoptees, who are participants in safe families, um, either as hosts or as resource people, or there are people in Embrace who just want to support any of those families in whatever way um, they can, whether it's financially or just through items or just as a prayer partner as well. And so we we were going through a book, um, mm-hmm. Reframing Foster Care, mm-hmm. and we were talking about, as a group, what it would look like to support vulnerable families in Denver um, before they enter foster care. And so out of that conversation as a group came say families Mm -hmm. and then our partnership, right? Yep. Yeah. And did you already know of the organization, Becky, and the work that they were doing? I had read about it in a book and then, um, Emily Stam. Yeah. Emily knew Mm -hmm. about him too. Mm -hmm. Emily oversees our pastoral care systems and, a ministry and helps lead, embrace, and organize, embrace along with the two of you, I think. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. And the Coors. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and Josh and Elizabeth Coors are also yep. integral forces. Yes, in embrace. <laughs> yep. So I want to wrap up our conversation today with asking our Fellowship Denver family to contemplate these ideas that we've talked about, what it looks like to hold our lives, our time, our resources with open hands to be used on behalf of vulnerable peoples as God directs us, and what it could look like to be involved with safe families specifically or with our embrace group here at Fellowship. And so you mentioned some of the ways specifically, Becky, a moment mm-hmm. ago that someone can be involved with safe families if one of those roles is of interest to someone. So being a host family or being a family friend or a resource partner, any of those different ways to be involved are of interest to someone. Where could they go to get connected with safe families or to find resources about safe families? The easiest way is just to go onto the Safe Families website. So if you Google Safe Families Denver Chapter, um, it's a pretty easy website to navigate, and it'll show you the different roles, and it'll bring you to an application that you can fill out online, and you can go from there. You can also talk to Becky. (laughs) Yes, you can definitely (laughs) talk to me. I'm the one chasing the six children around the sanctuary. (laughs) I don't know. There are many, many children in the True. sanctuary, so it it's might true. be hard it's to true. identify the one you. The head count. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, I want to say thank you to both of you for the ways for spending time with me today, but for the ways that you have embraced this in your life. I think those three areas of radical hospitality, disruptive generosity, and intentional compassion are something that you live out. And I'm so grateful for your presence here, for your encouragement to all of us to consider this group of vulnerable families, those impacted by foster care, and then particularly through this new partnership with Safe Families. And in thinking about this overlapping aspect of often that families in poverty are greatly impacted in a variety of ways by these needs, but really of this partner in it of relational poverty, how those two are woven together. What would you encourage people at fellowship to consider is a parting thought Maybe what is a way they can be involved directly, even if they assess their time and say, I don't actually know that I have space to invite in a foster kiddo or a safe families or host safe families. But there are definitely other, I think you called them wraparound ways to support a family Mm -hmm. that offer both Mm -hmm. financial or economic resources, even if they're in a small or simple way, and 
relational resources. So what's your final encouragement as far as consider these ways to be involved and then ask God to direct you in that? I think the biggest thing would be to consider that God calls all of us to support in this area um, and that we all have different gifts and that they all can be used to support vulnerable families um, in Denver or or anywhere. Um, there's a couple books that, that talk about that, that Embrace reads as well. Um, there's one called Until There's More Than Enough and Everyone Can Do Something, if anybody's interested in reading more about it. Um, but there, there are so many ways that, that people can support. Um, I know for Mark and myself, we are at capacity in our home, both physically. We have no more bedrooms, no more beds. Um, we cannot take kids into our home at this point. I'm also at capacity emotionally and <laughs> relation, relationally with my kids, but mm-hmm. I can support in other ways um, through, through Embrace here at church. There's even creative ways that anybody can use their skills or gifting um, some of the ideas in that have come out of Embrace are maybe a photographer takes photos of new newly foster families um, so the kid can see a picture of him or herself on the wall of, of their current home. Or the kid has um, a picture to give to their biological family as well. Um, or just to see themselves in a, in a new way. Um, there's been stories of people who've owned restaurants who would cater for a parents' night out or a sort of foster support group, um, and that's how they give back. They don't necessarily take kids into their home, but they would support through their business. There's stories of business owners who would take former foster youth or current foster kids and do specific job training with them. Um, there's stories of construction workers who would donate their services for anybody trying to become certified. I know for our home, we had to have a handrail for more than five steps and we had six steps. And so we had to put in a handrail to meet certification codes. So there's construction workers who would offer their services to families who are looking to become certified. Um, there's, I don't know what else there's like financial donations. Mm -hmm. We have a meal (laughs) train with embrace for people who either just are in a really busy season of their lives because that happens. Um, and also in particular when we have new placements, um, Mm -hmm. because there's just a flurry of appointments and everything. Um, we also have a resource closet for people who are taking in new foster or safe families placements because they often don't come with clothes. But I think the biggest thing is just to be intentional about reaching out either to foster families or people that are involved with safe families that you know, um, or just vulnerable people that you interact with that you think might need a friend Mm -hmm. because, you know, we all need friends. And I think also approaching those relationships with some grace Mm -hmm. because you just don't know what sort of things people have been through or are processing and um, just looking for the best in people when you see some challenging behaviors. I think that's an excellent way to land this. Practice intentional compassion. Look around you and see who it is that is in your life already that is in a vulnerable state or is in pain and ask how it is what you have, your life, your resources, can become theirs if you weave your life together with them relationally. You can offer your presence and your kindness um, regardless of what it, what else it is that you assess that you have to offer. If you're listening to today's episode and are interested in getting to know more about our Embrace community, you can find some information on Fellowship Denver's website, fellowshipdenver.org. You can also email me any questions about today's episode or suggestions that you have for the podcast in the future. If you want to get connected personally to Becky or Jen, you can send me those emails too. Send all of that anytime to podcast at fellowshipdenver.org. Thanks for joining us on the Vision for Life podcast. Thanks to Adam Englund for our theme music and to our producer, Jesse Cowan. 